Hello, hello, hello. Thank you. <laughs> I am Pastor Susie Hutchison. Let me extend the welcome that was offered earlier. I am grateful for each of you who choose to worship with us. When I look around, I am reminded of the Imago Dei. That's the fancy church way of saying the image of God. It is present in every person, and I give thanks for the beautiful mosaic that gathers here today, in person and online. It reveals to us just how beautifully diverse God is. We can't know all of God without knowing all of each other. So thank you for bearing witness here of that Imago Dei that you carry. Today we're beginning a short series on the Bible book of Ruth. We don't often take the time to read that book. It's found in the Old Testament, also known as the Hebrew Bible. It's a short book found between Judges and 1 Samuel. And if you've read the Hebrew Bible, you know that a good portion of that massive text is about identity. The Israelites were a fairly small group of people living in a very diverse world. If you look at a map, you'll notice that the land they lived on is like a land bridge. You can see here that you couldn't go by land to or from Egypt or the rest of the resource-rich continent of Africa without traipsing through the land of the Israelites. If you were Babylonian or Persian and wanted access to lands around the Mediterranean, you had to go through the land of the Israelites. This means that quite often they were getting invaded. And more often, pockets of folks from other parts of the world settled there. Some deciding to quit their journey before crossing the very hot Sinai Peninsula or coming from the other direction, thought that they'd landed into paradise after crossing the desert, or they were so tired from their journey that they just gave up and couldn't go any further. So, the land of the Israelites has always been diverse. With that kind of diversity often comes a desire to differentiate your culture to define what it is that makes you unique. For the Israelites, the thing that set them apart was their belief in Yahweh, the God of Moses and Abraham. Much of the Hebrew Bible speaks to the struggle to, remain, to retain their faith in Yahweh in a world filled with other gods. Sounds kind of familiar to us in our world. People don't often call the things they worship a god now because they like to retain their attachment to Christianity or whatever the religion is. But, but their primary identities are often in other things. Their job, their nation, their education, status. And then when a conflict arises between Yahweh and these other gods, they bristle. And the little gods they seem to win more often than not. Like so many stories in the Hebrew Bible, Ruth's story is about the things that go wrong in life. It's a story that no one would choose for themselves. But it's also a story about strength and perseverance and relationship. So let me set this story up for you. It takes place at the same time as the book of Judges. There's a famine in Israel. A woman named Naomi, which by the way means pleasant and gentle, she and her husbands and their two sons leave to find a place to live that is not suffering from the famine. They land in a place called Moab. Moab was a veritable oasis in the desert. But the people who lived there were notoriously in conflict with the Israelites. The family settles in for some number of years, and then Naomi's husband dies. She's a widow with two sons, and that would be a pretty tough life. 
I'm not sure how old her sons are, but with sons, she still held some value and hope in her culture. Eventually, her sons grow up and they marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Now, I don't know much about the Moabite society, but in this era, it was mostly true that a married woman cared for her mother-in-law. And we find out later that these daughters-in-law have converted to the faith of their husbands, where we know that that was the tradition. So Naomi was cared for by Orpah and Ruth. About 10 years later, the sons die too. So now we have Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah. They have no men to provide for them nor to protect them. They are in pretty dire straits. It sounds like they may have become gleaners. Do you know what gleaners are? Some of you do. In Leviticus, people were ordered to leave the edges of their field ungathered when they harvested so that people who needed food could come and gather it. And that wasn't unique to the Jewish people, though, although the amount left would have been generous. But all the cultures took care of their poor in this kind of way. They allowed them onto their fields after the harvest to glean what they could gather. But Naomi gets word that the famine in Israel has ended. So she and her daughters-in-law quit their work in the fields and head down the road toward Judah. Three women traveling alone. That's a dangerous situation. We meet these women in verses 8 through 21 of chapter 1. Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, turn back, each of you, to the household of your mother. May the Lord deal faithfully with you, just as you have done with the dead and with me. May the Lord provide for you so that you may find security, each woman in the household of her husband. Then she kissed them and, and and they lifted up their voices and wept. But they replied to her, No, instead we will return with you to your people. Naomi replied, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Will there again be sons in my womb that they would be husbands for you? Turn back, my daughters. Go. I am too old for a husband. If I I were to say that, I have hope even if I had a husband tonight. And even more, if I were to bear sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you refrain from having a husband? No, my daughters. This is more bitter for me than for you, since the Lord's will has come out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and, and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth stayed with her. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law is returning to her people and to her gods. Turn back as your sister in- after your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to abandon you, to turn back from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do this to me, and more so, if even death separates me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her about it. So both of them went along until they arrived at Bethlehem. When they arrived at Bethlehem, the whole town was excited on account of them, and the the women of the town asked, Can this be Naomi? She replied to them, Don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara, for for the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has returned me empty. Why would you call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has deemed me guilty? I already told you that Naomi means pleasant and gentle. Mara means bitter with an implication of strength. You see, the Naomi who had long ago left Bethlehem for Moab with her husband was a a pleasant and a gentle woman. But life happened. She returned to Bethlehem feeling bitter and strong. We might say jaded today. Life had run her over, and she was stronger 
but less gentle, less trusting of the world's goodness. Life has a way of changing us. Naomi has suffered terrible losses. Her husband, her sons, her daughter-in-law Orpah, and Naomi has done something that most women do not do in her day. She and Ruth have traveled unaccompanied and unprotected by a man from Moab all the way to Bethlehem, and it is a hard journey. It's a hard journey for any woman, and I'd imagine it's even worse for a woman of her age. Her journey had fundamentally changed her, made her tougher and, and maybe a little jaded. She has a journey she never wanted. She has a journey that no one would choose. Have you ever had to walk through those kinds of experiences? My nephew Sam was four years old when he started to complain about his legs hurting. After a few complaints and a few tears, his parents took him to the doctor. The doctor sent him to the hospital. Within 24 hours, he was diagnosed with cancer, and in a few days more, it had a name. Stage 4 neuroblastoma. Not what any parent wants to hear. It would be a five-year journey. A few years into that journey, I remember my sister-in-law, Margo, telling me that she was listening to her favorite podcast. It's it's one where three sisters who live in different parts of the country call each other and talk about various kind of mundane things. And on this particular day, I think it was Thanksgiving or thereabouts, one of the women was complaining about something her child had done. And she seemed to just not be able to let it go. And one of her sisters responded, could be worse, at least your kid doesn't have cancer. And Margot said it hit her like a ton of bricks. She was the person that no one wanted to be. In the eyes of much of the world, she had the worst possible life. Life is hard. Most of us have lived at least one storyline we would not have chosen a disease, a divorce, a death, a feeling, a failure, a love, a loss. What's the story you do not want? You probably cannot get rid of that story, but you already know that, right? You've already tried everything in your power to write a different story. This book of Ruth shows us that we are not alone. Other people tread the same path, and when we dare to accept it, there are people willing to journey with these unknown, scary, even dangerous stories with us. When we love each other well, when we choose faithful companions in the joys of our lives, we have partners to walk with us through the hard days. Orpah, Ruth, and Naomi. They shared the heydays of their lives. They were there for each other while Naomi's sons were alive. They, they shared the everyday struggles of household lives. They shared the hopes and dreams and, and expectations of a future. And then they shared the tragedies of death and fear, and hunger. Orpah stayed through all of that. She even set out on the road to Judah with Naomi and Ruth. Orpah loved Naomi, and Naomi loved Orpah. Do you have friends like that? Do you have friends who will sit with you at the doctor's office and take notes so that you don't forget anything? Which friends can you call at midnight when your child has not come home yet? 
Who can you ask to, to clean your house when your back aches or your MS relapses or your, your leg is casted or, or your depression overwhelms you? Those are the orpas in your life. They are the ones who won't run away when the story turns ugly. They are a valuable treasure. And when Naomi had a plan, when she dared to imagine returning to her old life, she told Orpah to return to her own life, and Orpah did. Ruth did not. Ruth says, don't urge me to abandon you, to turn back from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do this to me, and more so, if even death separates me from you. Ruth was bonded to Naomi. She was committed to being with her, not merely through the good days, not merely until she got over the crises of her bad days. She was committed to being with her as she grew and became, as she recreated herself. Ruth chose to love Naomi no matter what. Do you have a Ruth in your life? If you haven't tested it, you don't know. Maybe you think it's the person you've known the longest or the, the person you spend the most amount of time with, but that's not often how it ends up. The Ruths are not always the people you expect. Should you find yourself in a story you don't want, I hope you have a Ruth. I hope you have a Ruth in your life who will love you all the way through the redemption and the renewal. And whether you have a flesh and bones Ruth or not, you know you're not alone. God walks with us through the good days of plentiful harvest and loving families. God walks with us through the days we're crumpled in the shower sobbing and carrying the weight of grief in our hearts. God walks with us as we begin to dream a new dream, write a new future. God is with us as we lay a new foundation, as we fail and try again. And... God calls us, this community of Christian people, to be Ruth for each other. Look around you at this great Imago Dei. Look around you at, at the wealth of experiences, trials and triumphs, births and deaths, redemption, reconciliation and renewal that has gathered under this roof and digitally. None of us has lived your exact story. But together, this mosaic of our lives and experiences assembled, we are your Ruth. We are here for you from the moment we committed to you at your baptism to the day we sing at your funeral. And we'll be there when we are all celebrating our resurrections. Life is hard. It is going to change us. But God remains steadfast. And this community will be your Ruth, refusing to abandon you and seeing you all the way through to renewal and redemption and resurrection. Amen.